When thinking of a cruise on the Rhine, most will recall the magnificence of the Rhine Gorge from those tour brochures. Certainly we will show you the scenic splendours of the gorge, but also the cities, the industries, and the ceaseless commercial shipping on the busiest river in Europe. A group of mainly British waterway enthusiasts are setting out from Nijmegen in the Netherlands all the way to Switzerland. The town may still seem asleep, but the ceaseless river traffic is as busy as ever. It's about 6 a.m. in early May 2007. This, the main stream of the Rhine Delta, is known as the Wall in the Netherlands. Our ship is named Rigoletto. Built in 1987, she ran for the German KD company as William Tell. During breakfast, a mist arose as we crossed without formality into Germany. This was to have been a nuclear power station, but due to a change of political control, it was never commissioned. The structures have been turned into a theme park. The cooling towers have been painted with mountains. The river must be periodically dredged to remove material washed down from the higher ground. iron ore barges returning to Rotterdam from the Ruhr steelworks, the most impressive regular traffic on the Rhine. Distances on the Rhine are measured from the outflow of Lake Constance. Cattle on the beach. The fire brigade on a practice run. Behind the moored cruise ship, the remains of a rail bridge destroyed in the war. Behind the passing cargo ship is the mouth of the river Lippa. The entrance of the vessel, Dateln Canal,
loading bulk salt, an important raw material for the chemical industry, which has some large works served by water transport, as we shall later see. The salt arrives by rail from a nearby mine. Shrouded above the water line, it's likely she's been involved in a collision. Although not as green as the wind turbine, smoke cleaning equipment is in use at this power station, whose output is many, many times greater. They really can stack the containers high along this part of the Rhine. Lunch has now interrupted filming. We entered the major port of Duisburg before it could resume. Having approached by the Haven Canal, we're now turning at the mouth of the first of three vast basins, beyond which is the entrance lock of the rhine hern Canal. This leads to the Dortmund-Ems Canal and the 200-mile Mittelland Canal, which gives commercial shipping access to Berlin, Poland and beyond. The trip boat demonstrates Duisburg's pride in the history of the area's heavy industry and of water transport's contribution to it. <laughs> These yellow boxy vessels have crossed the Atlantic not on their own, but aboard a mothership, their American Lighter Aboard Ship, or LASH barges, also to be seen on the Mississippi network. There aren't so many of those slow revving diesels around now, and we return from the Haven Canal back to the Rhine. We moored here at Ruhrort to visit the Waterway Museum close by. To the right of the entry to the Haven Canal is the mouth of the River Ruhr. It's navigable to Essen. Throttle controls for Rigoletto's twin engines are by the captain's right hand. Although it looks large, this is but a small part of the vast German chemical industry. In close contrast, the houses of Essenberg. However, more heavy industry looms ahead. Yes, another tow of six empty iron ore barges returning to Rotterdam. In front of the tanks, the entrance to Parallel Haven was scarcely visible. This is Duisburg's outer haven. It leads eventually to a yacht marina. Quite a contrast here between the opposite riverbanks.
post-war reconstruction beside the remains of the old bridge. The start of Rheinhausen's inland port. The Manisman tube works. They make pipes, big ones. But across the river, it's open country. That's the blast furnace where they make the raw iron. It's an assembly of a double load of containers to which has been attached on this side a barge of new tractor units for articulated lorries. Just along from the huge chemical plant is the much nicer waterfront of Erdigen. On the right is the entrance to Krefeld's harbour. It's set in the mouth of a small tributary. The lighter colouring of the lower bank side is the clue that the water level is low. It had been rather a dry winter with little alpine snow, the slow melting of which usually keeps the springtime levels higher. Here comes a new development, a purpose-built container ship with an internal cellular framework to hold the load more securely. These ships are built in China and brought to Europe stacked aboard large ocean-going ships, which are loaded and unloaded by pairs of the very largest floating cranes. We're now coming to Dusseldorf. As we shall be mooring to the left bank, we approach on that side, contrary to the general rule of navigation on the right. So we display the blue board with a flashing white light to signal our intention. The blue board is displayed in acknowledgement of ours. Lunch will interrupt filming of our arrival in Dusseldorf, but let's see the city from a non-stop passage the previous autumn. So in early October, the container ship is on the same course as Rigoletto was to take the following May. The tram system of Dusseldorf has been upgraded to a metro, the trains of which cross the river on the former tram tracks. Rigoletto was to moor here for a trip ashore. Beyond the footbridge is the inland port, a complex of six basins. 
Rigoletto moored at Dusseldorf for us to board coaches to visit a unique form of transport. We're heading for the city of Wuppertal in its narrow valley to ride the monorail. It's the local equivalent of a metro. Our film will include some archive film from the 1960s. The poor picture quality will tell you which it is. The line was considered a great novelty when it opened in 1901. The western end of the line is over the street and nowadays crosses a motorway cut through the town. From this point the line forsakes the streets to follow the river Wupper for the rest of the route. These are all metal structures, so must be painted regularly to prevent corrosion. A bigger job here than the fourth bridge, maybe. The line is eight miles long. The prototype articulated train in 1963. The old vehicles had no compressor for the air brakes, so the driver had to connect his train to the compressed air supply at each end of the run. We'll return to Rigoletto on her way up the Rhine, now 18 miles above Dusseldorf. Rigoletto is steered by the tiny joystick under the captain's left hand. An instrument in front of him shows the rudder's position. Another vast chemical works. Using low-cost transport by water for their bulk materials is important to their economics. The installation's essential firefighting tug Now a brief glimpse of the mouth of the river Wupper. It's not navigable.
Prudently, most of the town is well back from the river to lessen the risk of flooding. Yet another huge chemical works. Stacks of containers, including tanks in container-sized frames. By way of a change, this seems to be Dagenham and Rhine. So that's the Ford Motor Works, and in the distance, the Bayer Chemical Works. How many lorries would it take to shift this lot? Moving so many containers with one crew must be seriously good economics. See the playpen in front of the wheelhouse? This ship's run by a family with children. The twin spires of Cologne's cathedral are now on the skyline below the bridge. Tankers don't come larger than this on the Rhine. We're mooring for free time ashore in Cologne. We're leaving Cologne during lunch. Six tracks cross this rail bridge and there's a footway on each side. This second railway bridge is used only by freight. This is as far upriver as the trip boat goes. River Police. Bank protection work is in progress here. Godorf Haven serves a Shell oil refinery and the adjacent chemical works.
seems an odd situation for that large red crane arm. Maybe it serves as a memorial to previous heavy industry here. She's anchored. Perhaps they don't work at weekends. Must be someone's watch on the Rhine. The tram on the bridge is crossing from Bonn to Boyle. Several passenger ships have come here to join this evening's procession of boats, part of the annual Rhine in Flames event. <laughs> so Rigoletto continues upriver from the capital of the former Western Germany towards the starting point of the procession. Spectators have already arrived to be sure of good views of the fireworks display. One of the passenger ships which ply the Rhine Gorge. We'll be seeing more of the Arms of Cologne soon. Part of the tram service from Königswinter to Bonn. Cars drive on to the ferry which crosses to Bad Godesberg. Vineyards now occupy the south-facing slopes. Reaching Nannenwert Island, we're catching up to other procession ships. Rigoletto turns to take up our position near the head of the procession. Off-duty crew have come out to watch the spectacle. Not to be confused with the city of Linz on the Danube. Now we're all just waiting until it's dark.
It's now early Sunday morning. Anglers have already set up. After being moored for much of the night, we're now only 28 miles up from Bonn. Although the water's a bit low, the current's strong. The motorway, its bridge centered on an island, cuts right through the towns on both sides of the river. It's still a little misty yet, that's a sign of a fine day to come. Maybe she got up there in a flood. Located behind a floodplain, this village hopes to avoid being inundated. The commercial traffic seems to take only a short break on Sunday mornings. Ahead now is Koblenz. The river Moselle, or Mosel in German, joins the Rhine here on our right. Right by the junction, the floodplain has become a caravan park. They call this spot Deutsches Eck, literally Germany's corner. That's Kaiser Wilhelm I on the horse. Koblenz Yacht Haven. Beyond these, the next bridge is at Wiesbaden, 84 kilometers, 52 miles, further on. At last we come to the famous scenic section, the Rhine Gorge. An empty tanker is trying to move the heavily loaded push tow behind, which has run aground. One of the regular shipments from the Danube via the canal connection opened in 1992. The mouth of the river Lahn, navigable for 85 miles. The first of the Rhine castles, Schloss Stolzenfels, above the village of that name. The gorge is a transport highway of long standing. There's a road and a railway along each bank, as well as the constant river traffic. Flying the Austrian flag, this too will have come through from the Danube. The hills on the west side fall back here, but not for long. Low water has exposed this hazard, normally submerged. On the east bank are Braubach and Marksburg Castle. The striped buoy marks one end of a midstream shoal. The railway on the east bank was for long the traditional line for freight. A crane is obscuring part of the name of the Shottle shipyard.
the West Bank line now carries freight. Since the high speed line opened, more direct it runs through the hills. On the left, Berg Sternberg, and on the right, Berg Liebenstein, the hostile brothers of legend. The heavy container train is hauled by two privately owned diesel locomotives, despite the route being electrified. On the opposite bank, a trackwork contractor's train. Double-deck local trains are quite common in Germany. The water level seems very low here. The mouth of St. Gore's Harbour and Burg Rheinfels above. We now approach a series of very sharp bends, so sharp that the push toes take up the full width of the river as they pass. So a signalling system is provided to advise upgoing craft of descending traffic approaching unseen. Over on the bank, the signals say no tow is presently descending through the tricky bends. The prominent word cargo on the red loco identifies its ownership as the Swiss Federal Railways. The cliff on the left is the 400 foot high Lorelei, famous for the legendary golden haired siren luring sailors onto the rocks. Rigoletto has now slowed to the speed of the current, so in effect we have stopped until the signal allows the tow ahead of us to continue upstream. Note the blue over yellow flag of Ukraine on this workboat. They'll have arrived via the Danube. More private locomotives. These two are electric. This is the control center for the river signals. We moored here to taste the wares of a local vintner. A 
As well as its wine, Oberwesel is noted for having several towers and for Schoenberg Castle. Routine repairs to the riverbank, but today is Sunday. There are many castles along the Rhine, but only one in the Rhine. The Falz, the best place to them all for exacting tolls from the river traffic in bygone years. Notice the castle's diamond ground plan to minimize damage from flood water and the impact of large items like tree trunks. Some of the training walls extend far into the river. Their purpose is to speed the flow, so ensuring that silt isn't allowed to build up, thus maintaining the river's depth. This is definitely a gotcha, so we have. She's Belgian. There is a great amount of energy going to waste here. How long before the Germans are compelled to build hydroelectric plants to provide the power everyone seems to need without carbon dioxide emissions? It's from such painted inscriptions one can tell the vessel's length, breadth and tonnage. Run by the KD Company, she's the last paddle steamer in daily scheduled service on the Rhine. This quarry supplied much of the material used to rebuild Holland's dikes after the floods of 1953. The gorge is ending. This area, known as the Binger Loch, has the strongest flow of the entire Rhine. In former years, descending vessels would take on a pilot for the transit of the gorge, while upgoing craft would need the aid of tugs to overcome the powerful current. The mouth of the river Naha The Niederwald monument looks down on a million vines. A section of a new bridge in the careful control of two tugs. Distant Bingen Harbour, base of the tugs and the pilots. Two ferries cross to Bingen from Rudersheim, this for vehicles and this one for pedestrians. The directive of the European Union opened the national rail networks to independent train operators. This company specializes in serving the chemical industry. The wine town of Rudersheim is a rather tacky tourist trap sort of place, beloved of the operators of hotel boats. The hills are ending. We'll break for dinner. We resume entering Wiesbaden in mid-evening. The main channel passes between two large islands and our surroundings become industrial. 
an intercity express high-speed train, but of course not on a high-speed line here. Containers do certainly seem big business. This is the city of Mainz, famed for the development of printing. You may see one of the first printed Bibles, a Gutenberg Bible, in the Museum of Printing. Rigoletto will be moored here overnight. It's six in the morning as we leave Mainz. Judging by the waterline mark on the bridge, river levels down at least a metre. The modern concrete and glass contrast starkly with the cathedral's red sandstone towers. It may not look much, but behind that vessel coming downstream is the start of the route to the Danube and the Black Sea. 240 miles of river mine, 106 miles of new canal, then 1,500 miles of the river Danube. Time now to go to breakfast. Three rows of cars, 16 cars in a row. It all adds up to a very valuable cargo. Note how the loading ramps on both vessels fold upwards, although the barge is presently loaded with containers. That must have been a vast gravel pit. Could this be a nuclear power station? It's a grain silo. Seems they now use lorries. Oh no, more industry. This is the northern outskirts of Worms. Worms Pagel, one of a series where the river's depth is constantly monitored. It's raining, so the crew are hosing down the top deck. The North Haven marks the start of yet another chemical works. With four and a half kilometers of river frontage, BASF's Ludwigshafen works must be the longest yet. In contrast, the East Bank. Behind the small craft is the mouth of the river Neckar. It's 113 miles up there to Stuttgart and the Neckar is navigable for nine miles beyond. The Rhine separates not only the cities but also the provinces of Rhineland-Pfalz and Baden-Württemberg. During lunch, we have traveled 14 miles upriver. We're arriving at Speyer. The cathedral dominates the skyline above the harbor.
The nearby Technical Museum is a must. Exhibits of almost all forms of transport, from a submarine to a 747. Operated by the same firm as Rigoletto, but flying the Bulgarian flag. The Broad River now crosses a flat, monotonous plain. As the weather's worsening, we'll resume in the morning. Now, 40 miles above Speyer, we come to our first lock. For the last 10 miles, the West Bank has been in France. Electricity is generated from the river's 34-foot fall here. Vessels moor to floating bollards, which rise as the lock fills, saving crew much work. Rigoletto has side control panels normally covered, where the skipper has views of the full length of the ship. A push tow will be sharing the lock with us. The lower gate closes sideways very slowly. The floating bollards tend to squeal as they move. On the bank is a spare top gate. The water on the far side of the artificial island is destined for the turbines of the power station. Although the river banks are raised, only the rare gap gives any view. The continuous trees are vital as their roots reinforce the banks. Due to a history of past floods, villages and towns keep their distance. The sole signs of industry are loading facilities for sand or gravel. Fifteen miles above Ifitzheim Lock comes Gamsheim Lock, but this one's to starboard on the French side. A strong crosswind makes it impossible to hold the camera steady. As before, this lock has a rise of about 34 feet. The hills are those of the Black Forest. Seven miles from Gamsheim Lock, we come on the German bank to the mouth of the river Kinzig and to the port of Kell. This plant produces industrial gases. The port of Strasbourg now appears to starboard. Safely tucked away beyond the bridge is the petroleum port. This vast port area seems strangely empty. And so to the North Lock, an entrance to the French Canal network. An electric motor inside the hut is hauling the gate. The difference in water levels is very small. An industrial line crosses by a swing bridge. 
straight on leads to the French canals, but Rigoletto is much too big for them. The main users of this large canal now are hotel boats like ours and houseboats. Barges of the 350 tons, French standard size, are now too small to be competitive for many cargoes, so now they're static dwellings. Not houseboats, but the principal exhibits of a waterways museum, housed in the Pusher Strasbourg. We're mooring for a short exploration of Strasbourg's waterways in a craft of suitable size. First, a rare opportunity to view Rigoletto from the water. Fortunately, the rain ends before we disembark. We'll explore the historic center on foot. Strasbourg's wide canal forms a loop off the Rhine. We shall continue southwards to rejoin the river through a similar lock. Wouldn't you like one of those? The French hotel boats load up here. This one's a French chemical works. The south lock is ready for us. Sideways moving gates permit lock operation regardless of the relative levels of river and canal. No CCTV here. Four new basins comprise the new port of Strasbourg to the south of the city. The larger of the two chambers of Strasbourg lock ahead is closed for repairs. There's a queue, we may be in for a long wait. This tow seems to be getting preference, but is in fact going to park the third barge, as the assembly is too wide for the lock. In we go! It seems a long way inland to find a colony of gulls. Overnight, Rigoletto will pass through another five locks. Scenically, we miss little along this wide plain between the Black Forest and the Vosges. 
Next morning, we're passing installations of the port of Malouz, about eight miles east of the city. We are now on the Grand Canal d'Alsace, which closely parallels the Rhine. Built between 1928 and 1959, each of its four locks has a hydroelectric power station. Ahead now, Ottmarsheim lock and electricity generating station. No floating bollards at this lock. <laughs> Table Mountain, we think. Below the bridge is the imposing start of the Canal du Rhône au Rhine. Enlargement of this through route to the Rhône and hence to the Mediterranean was stopped in 1997. So the biggest craft able to navigate throughout are those we've seen now used as houseboats. Kem's lock and power station, the highest on the Grand Canal, were built in 1932. Never know, it might have been a bypass. This lock will raise us about 43 feet. Floating bollards have been added here in recent years. As an early installation of underfloor water inlets, air vents were thought necessary. The idea wasn't repeated. Three miles above Kem's Lock, water flows over this weir to the Rhine's natural course. The river still forms the border between France and Germany, although we are approaching the Swiss city of Basel. This new bridge links Weil am Rhein to Hunig in France. Now the east bank is Swiss. This is Basel Docks. The spiky object marks three countries corner, although the borders actually meet in mid-river. The entrance of the closed Hunig Canal is almost at the end of French territory. Migro is the largest Swiss retailer. As we shall be going beyond Basel, we must pause to pick up a pilot. I think I can manage to take this bike. St. Johann's Ferry waits for us to pass. One of Basel's four flying ferries each hangs from a cross river cable and is powered by the force of the current. These trams have seven articulated sections. For centuries, the bridge on this site was the only one across the Rhine between Lake Constance and the sea. One spire of the red sandstone minster is under repair. The little hut and balcony are for fishing with a drop net. A through freight into Switzerland from Germany. The Börse comes from part of the northern Jura. 
the only power station and large lock combination on the Rhine, wholly within Swiss territory. It's a local trip boat ahead of us. A stork enjoys the isolation of the Lock Island. From here, the riverbank on our left is again German territory. Four miles on, Augst is the last lock on the Rhine. It's also the smallest. A potentially hazardous cross current flows from the power station. A large passenger ship here is a very rare sight. The Germans have a power station on their side too. Trip boats already returning from Rheinfelden. The highest wharf on the Rhine, but when did it last have a delivery by water? Rheinfelden Bridge marks the limit of navigation, except for small craft, able to pass the ten dams by aid of rollers, cranes or other devices. Such small boats may continue another 60 miles to the Rhine Falls at Neuhausen. We are returning to Basel, having turned at Rheinfelden. Up on the church tower is a stork's nest. How do they stay up there in such a strong wind? Here's one of the fishing drop nets, like we saw in the city, in use. As the trip boat has just descended, we must wait for Augst Lock to be refilled. Rebuilt in recent years, this lock has emergency stop buttons and a unique style of floating bollards. Easy to lubricate, it should avoid the loud squeals made by earlier designs. A much larger Swiss cargo port has developed above Basel than the original close inside the border. From here, imports move to the rest of Switzerland without having to pass through the city. preparing for the low bridge. The St. Alban ferry, powered entirely by the force of the current. The lower deck of this bridge is part of a through route into France, avoiding the city streets. Rigoletto is turning in order to moor facing upstream with her bow dividing the strong current. So we come to the end of our Rhine voyage, 445 miles from Nijmegen, or a total of 470 miles, including the run to Rheinfelden and back.